Open your Bibles. I'll be in Mark 3 in a moment. But first, just a very quick review. Not a complete review, just a quick review. I was in Luke chapter 9 last Wednesday night. And we looked at verses 37 through 42. Here we see in these verses the unclean spirit and some of the characteristics of an unclean spirit and how it possesses a person. Now if you go to the board, you see in verse 42 in Luke chapter 9, And as yet a coming the devil drew him down, threw him down, excuse me, and tore him. And Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit. Agatharthos in the Greek. And of course, if you look it up, generally you'll find it, the definition to mean, to, to mean unclean or foul or some connection with idol worship, mostly in the food offerings that were presented to idols. And of course, I made the claim that it also has connection with people that wor worship idols in general. Now, you can come back to me. We'll get to other words, God willing, tonight. Now, idol worship. I don't want anybody to get me wrong. The reason why I'm bringing this up now is because we're taking a look how Muhammad set himself up, really, to be a candidate to become demon-possessed by, which I believe is an unclean spirit. And you'll see unclean spirits both in the New Testament and the Old Testament. A certain type possession. I believe one of the worst type possessions. And of course, if we look at Luke 9, as Jesus heals a boy with an unclean spirit, there's certain characteristics in chapter, I mean, in chapter 9, verse 39. Let's see if I can find room on the board to write these characteristics down again. It's going to be tough, but I'll try to find a space here. Of course, in verse 39, it says, And lo, a spirit taketh him, that the boy that is, and he suddenly cried out. First, you have, he takes, this unclean spirit takes. That was one. Two, he crieth out. So he cries. Three, and he teareth. He tears. I'm not going to have room there to put all of them. And he foameth. Foameth. And bruising. So bruising, that would be number five. And number six, I don't know if you can see that or not, Just that's bruising. And number six, let's just take number six over here. He threw. Now, we'll take a look at this and how Muhammad experienced all these things when I get to it. But he taketh, he crieth, he teareth, he foameth, he bruiseth, he bruises, and he threw. All characteristics what this unclean spirit was like in this boy here in Luke chapter 9. Come back to me now. And of course, we looked at Agatharthos. Now, those are the characteristics of an unclean spirit. In today's world, you might not be worshiping an idol. You not might be worshiping or practicing Islam or any other false religion or, doc or, um, or doctrine. You could be worshiping yourself. You could be worshiping money, gold, silver. Whatever you worship, whatever you seek, more than you seek the Lord Jesus. Some people worship fame and power, or both. It doesn't matter. You put yourself in a 
position where some other spirit is overtaking you and not the Holy Spirit. Now, some people don't even believe in the Holy Spirit. More than you can imagine. Some even in the Christian world don't believe in it. It's blasphemous in my opinion, but whatever it is, you can find yourself to be a candidate, whether you want to believe it or not, to be possessed by an unclean spirit. Not just an unclean spirit, though. There's other ways of becoming possessed. I'm just giving you the worst case scenario here. Agatharthos. That's the word there in the Greek. Agatharthos. Now, and then I finished the message because I didn't want to end just on the unclean spirit. I wanted it to end where there's victory through Christ when dealing with these unclean spirits. And I didn't make it to where I wanted to go, and I don't even know if I'm going to make it tonight. When we take a look at Muhammad and how this unclean spirit type of possession overtook him. But before I go there, or try to even get close to getting to Muhammad tonight, I want to revisit Mark 3.11. But let's start first with Mark 3.7. Chapter 3, verse 7. But Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea. And a great multitude from Galilee followed him, and from Judea, and from Jerusalem, and from Edomia, and from beyond Jordan. And they, and they about Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, when they had heard what great things he did, came unto him. The word got out, folks what Jesus was able to do. And he spake to his disciples that a small ship should wait on him because of the multitude, lest they should throng him. For he had healed many, insomuch that they pressed upon him for to touch him. Pressed, a better translation would be rushed upon him just so they can touch him. Kind of like a stampede, a human stampede. As many has had plagues. They wanted to touch him, the one that had plagues. And unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, that's one of their characteristics, crieth out, Thou art the Son of God. And remember I told you that these unclean spirits are nothing more than the watchers that had sexual intercourse with human, Eve-type people, not angelic-type people, but Adam and Eve-type, humankind, the kind of flesh and blood we're made out of. And they produced giants. Well, their offspring, their parents, the Watchers, got to see them die, according to the book of Enoch, Watch them see him, see, watch all of them one by one being slaughtered at, as was prophesied by Enoch to these watchers. And then once they saw that, the watchers be thrown into Tartutus in a cer certain section in Hades waiting for their day where they'd be thrown in the lake of fire. But their offsprings, the giants, once they died, they became disembodied spirits. They are the demons. They are the type of beings that look around to possess bodies. Angels already have a body, including falling angels. They don't look to go around possessing. They control these demons. Satan being at the top of the ladder, then his officers underneath him, and the different power structures that they would be placed that they would be placed in, some more powerful than others, and with a demon army, army to manipulate what they want, what they can do by using this disembodied spirits to possess a body. In this case, in Muhammad to begin 
the starting of the seventh, which eventually become the eighth, which has already beasts that we see in Scripture. That's just a quick review. If you want more than that, you go back to the other message. And if you really want more than that, you go back to the spiritual warfare series. That's all I can give you at this point. I don't have time to dwell on this that long. So th these unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. And he straightly charged them that they should not make him known. Now, I received the message concerning this. That's another message. I'll just read it to you. Looking at Mark 3.11 from tonight's teaching, I found it interesting that Agatharthos spirits would fall down before Jesus and cry, saying, Thou art the Son of God. Why would you find that interesting? That's the first thing I was puzzled with. I've said it enough. I read it. I don't remember which program it was. Probably in the Spiritual Warfare series when I was dealing with the spirit world. Not sure, but that's my guess. There's been so many messages. I can't remember everything that I preach and what message. <clears throat> but I said myself why is this person surprised and if this person surprised there might be others out there that surprised also these unclean spirits these demons that possess bodies because they're looking to possess bodies and they can't wait to get their marching orders of who to possess from the fallen angels beginning with satan on down to do their bidding in human life form why? Wasn't it Christ in the book of Enoch that condemned these people? And not these people, these disembodied spirits now? Wasn't it Noah that was preaching to all these individuals before the flood? But only eight responded? It's not like they didn't have a chance. It's not like they didn't know, especially after the fact, when they came to some bodies, who Christ was. Who God was. And you'll see in scriptures in the New Testament from place to place, they recognize who the Son of God was. It was Christ who condemned them to their faith. Fate, excuse me. It was Christ. And when he came in human form, they recognized him. Then it goes on to say, see, this is what I'm thinking. Someone read this verse and forget the real world event taking place here. Meaning, what is being told here is one is seeing and experiencing another actual flesh and blood human being just like themselves. Or it's so it seems. But the hidden reality of the matter is quite different. I don't want this teaching to be just a story in a book, if you know what I mean, and only relate a distant person, and only relate to a distant person in the scripture or historically distant Muhammad. And like I said just before I even read this, worshiping of idols or idolatry could put, you could put a lot of different definitions, especially in today's world. And I gave you a few examples from money to fame to power. No matter what the definition you put on it, if you find yourself worshiping something that is not Jesus Christ, you got a problem. And I also said last week that the human being before sin, I believe was completed, but after sin, he became a three element structure with a body, a soul, and a spirit. But because of sin, he was in a disconnect position now with God. Now with Christ coming and doing, doing, what, he, doing what he did, he reconnected us back to the Father. Thank God. Thank, thanks, Jesus. 
for doing that for us. And I've said that enough. But now we are a body, soul, spirit, and a partial pa payment has been given us. Paul makes that very clear in the Greek, a partial payment of the Holy Spirit. We don't have a complete payment. We'll never be completed here. I don't care who preaches differently. They're full of it. They're full of hot air. It goes against everything that Paul laid down. For a Christian to understand, grow, and to have hope that this ain't it. There's so much yet more to come. We just got to get there. What he has provided is good enough, sufficient enough. His blood saved us. The word will kind of give us the foundation, not kind of, will give us the foundation where we can establish ourselves and grow from a certain point all the way till we get over there, living on that line instead of the dot, the here and now, as I pointed out in the giving series. So I don't care how you use these scriptures for whatever condition you're in or you find someone else in. It could, be a, have, it could have multiple applications. I'm just trying to focus in on Muhammad. It can be, like I said, used in many different applications. But whatever application it is, make sure when you're dealing with someone with an unclean spirit, and let me tell you, I don't know many that can handle it. You might think you can. Be forewarned. It's something. For the most part, you don't want to find yourself in the middle of or dealing with. But that's a subject matter for demonology. Well, how do you know that? Experience. Not just once. Take my word for it. Experience. So the message goes on to read, this 21st century world is filled with real life agathos. And I agree, spirits today, and I'm looking forward to understanding how this teaching will apply in real life. Not sure if I'm wording that right, but I hope it sounds positive. Equally, I find it odd that scripture here says Jesus merely charged them that they should not make him known. Why it does not say Jesus casts out such agathos spirits makes me wonder. Who says that scripture does not say that? You remember, well, there's only a few of you that were around, that are still around, when I first started this ministry. Remember I told you, you have to know your Gospels inside and out. The first few years I was a Christian, I lived with Scrogi's Guide to the Gospel and other sources and materials to know the Gospels inside and out, backward and forward, if I... I cannot stress that enough, or else you'll make the error here, which I will point out here in a minute. Equally, I find it odd that scriptures here said Jesus merely charged them that they should not be, make him known. Why it does not say Jesus cast out such agathartho spirits makes me wonder. It sounds like these individuals left possessed and merely sil silenced as to who Jesus actually was. They were silenced to fulfill a prophecy out of Isaiah, which Matthew makes very clear. I suspect, as I have heard in the other instance with Paul, that timing was the issue here because of how it would have affected the crowd since what was said by these possessed persons were not a lie, was not a lie. But still, that, that Jesus didn't set them free from their unclean spirit, but still, that, that Jesus didn't set them free from their unclean spirit, and of course, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. I note, I note it does not say here what nationality they, these possessed persons are. It doesn't really matter. Once again, let me set the chronological order straight. That's why I like timelines. That's why I like charts. We find in Mark 3.11, before I go there, where it deals with verse 11, and unclean spirits when they saw him fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. 
which is nothing new, by the way. I told you that just a few moments ago. You'll find that throughout scriptures. One example of that before I set the chronological order and, uh, straight with, to answer this person's question. You go to Mark, no, not Mark, uh, Luke 4. You'll see an example of an unclean spirit here. I believe in verse... This, yes, this is where Jesus is healing many also. And we find in verse 40, Now when the sun was setting, all that they had, in, all they that had any sick with diverse diseases brought them into him and laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And devils also came out of many, crying out. The word should be demons. Thou art Christ, the Son of God. Here's another example. These demons crying out as they're coming out of these possessed people and he rebuking suffer them not to speak or to say that they knew him to be Christ and he rebuking them suffer them not to speak for they knew that he was Christ well here even though they were obviously saying and and confessing that he was the Christ Christ once again told them to be quiet. To be quiet. Don't say anything. Come out and shut up. There you see one example in Luke chapter 4. You see another example, I believe it's in here in Mark, in 1, the first chapter, verse. This is where Jesus healed many, many also. And then I think it's in verse, let's just start with 31. And he came, at, came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto them. And at even, when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased and them that were possessed, literally with demons. And all the city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases and cast out many demons, once again, and suffered not the demons to speak or to say that they knew him literally because they knew him these demons knew christ christ is the one that condemned them to the faith that they at that time presley were experiencing and probably still experiencing you got it now what about the chronological order so you see this event like i said over and over in the new testament in the gospel records Christ telling them to be quiet. Now, if you go to Matthew, regarding the question, and I'll repeat it, why does it not say Jesus casts out such agathartho spirits makes me wonder? Well, don't wonder any longer. Because if you go to Matthew 12, to put this in chronological order in the gospel record, you'll see, as soon as I get there, remember the Luke story? And in the Mark story, but Luke, Mark, Jesus heals a widow man's hand. Remember that? Well, this is where we find in the Luke story the connection along with the Mark story where Jesus, if you look at verse 15 in chapter 12 of Matthew, but when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from thence, and great multitude followed, followed him. He, that, that happened over and over. And he healed them all, and charged them that they should not make him known. Now you go to Mark chapter 3, verse 1, so you follow me and make the connection. Here, Jesus heals the man on the Sabbath day. And he heals this man on the Sabbath day. You see it in verse 1, verse 2 and 3. In verse 3 it says, And he said unto the man which had the withered hand. And he goes on, and then he finally 
heals the man with a withered hand. And then following that event, chronologically, you have the multitudes following Jesus by the sea. Well, you'll find that story also in Luke, but here in Matthew, <clears throat> you have that correlates with the same time period of Mark 3, 1, 6, and after that, those verses, here in Matthew 12, starting with verse 9, and by the time we get down to verse 15, which follows that withered hand event, as Mark 3, 11 did, here we have in Matthew chapter 12, verse 15, but when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all and charged them that they should not make him known. See, if you just read the Mark record, sure, I can see your point, that it sounds like an unclean spirit when they saw him fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. And it doesn't go into the next verse, as you'll see here in Matthew, that he healed them all. It just goes into verse 12 in Mark chapter 3, and he straightly charged them that they should not make him known. So you're left with the impression that Jesus did not deliver those people from those unclean spirits they found themselves captured by, possessed by. Well, that's why you've got to put all of the New Testament, especially the Gospels, in a chronological order how it happened. Remember I did that with James and Paul and Antioch and all those events? So we have a better outline how it went down why certain things happened? Because without that, you're not going to know when Galatians fit in, fitted in. Remember that? Those of you who were around, if you didn't, listen to those messages. I put it in chronological order, and then it made more sense how these events went down. Same thing here. In this record, when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. Same event. Just in a different gospel record, what I just read you in Mark 3.11. And charged them that they should not make him known, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant whom I am chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. So it was the fulfillment of prophecy that these events took place the way they took place. So... Don't be, caught by, don't be caught into the misunderstanding of how these events took place and if certain things happened. It did happen. Jesus delivered them. But when they were delivered, whether you find it in the Mark, Luke, or Matthew record, he gave them a command to shut up. To shut up. And so, then the mess, this other message, then this same message moves to another paragraph in the message that's asked additional question but hopefully i straighten that chronological order problem that this particular person was having and maybe there's others out there that's why i'm reading it to you tonight because i have a funny feeling that there's some that just can't put all this together well i just did it for you now it also goes on to say also it says these agathos spirits have the ability to say thou art the son of god to jesus himself so for us today, how does this play on the battlefield with those who have no issue saying Jesus is the Son of God, since Agathartho spirits can, can and do say this? I know James' record, and here's where some other scripture picking is pulled in, and this is a bad habit to do out of context, but you know, I'll read the message. You believe that, uh, I know James' record in 219, you believe that God is one, you do well, even the demons believe and tremble. Why wouldn't they believe? They were condemned by Christ, as I said. So, let's move on. And I hope I am not making the mistake of leaking unrelated items. Well, you are. But in 1 John, we learn that those who do not confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God, and this is that of the Antichrist. But yet, these same Antichrists, because I can't imagine they are unclean and not also Antichrist, can say, Thou art the Son of God. And also, no one who denies the Son has the Father. You don't think the devil can say that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? You think he's going to be rescued? That was the Son of God. And also, no one who denies the Son has the Father. Yet these agatharthos don't seem to be denying the Son. I guess what I'm saying is, can you clarify for me the obvious quandary above 
that I'm having... Well, let's go to 1 John. They didn't give me chapter and verse, by the way, in that message, and how many times I've told you, you didn't quote something, you quote the verses. Now, I know where to go, but still, you, need a, you want an answer, you be complete in your questioning, too. Don't have me chasing for these verses. Oh, that's not very kind. Well, I already instructed you how to do it. So either you're not listening or you're forgetful. I'm assuming this is just forgetful. This person is not a rebellious person that's asking this question. At least the way they communicate to me. We're all rebellious in one way or the other. Thank God we've been rescued by Jesus Christ. Let's go to 1 John. Now, 1 John chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, is where we're going to get to. But before we get there, let's read this verses that leads up to it. And whatsoever, I'm in verse 22, 1 John chapter 3, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Because we keep his commandments. And of course, we know that what those commandments are. Because John refers to the same commandments over and over again. Loving Jesus Christ and being connected to divine, John 15, who also wrote that letter, our gospel record, and loving one another. You'll see that throughout John's writings. Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe, or we should pistail there, we should have trust and confidence on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, as he gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he is abiding in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. Remember in John 15? This is an important... You don't have to go there. I'll just read it to you. In John 15, it also goes to say, in verse 16, where it reads, that whoever, she, whoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you, having trust and confidence in my name. Why are you going to have trust and confidence in my name? A lot of people ask, I mean, why are my prayers not answered? I said, and I said, well, you've been asking in Christ's name. And furthermore, as a faithing Christian, have you been carrying out Christ's command to be connected with him always? Because if you're not, you're not being nourished. And have you followed his command of loving one another? And not the sloppy agape and all the other definitions of love, but the definitions of love that I preach. Paul Spends a whole chapter, well, he spends more than that, but a whole chapter in the book of Romans dealing with it. That's where he shall ask in my Father's name, he may give to you. But it was conditional. It was conditional. Being connected to the vine and loving one another. Nothing's changed here in 1 John. And then Jesus then after verse 16, which I just read to you in John 15, he finishes up that part of the, what he was communicating, that thought, these things I command you that you love one another. So he tells them twice to do it. You got it? Back to 1 John chapter 3. And so whatever ye ask, you receive of him because you keep his commandments. John's just reiterating the same thing again what Jesus said. And do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should trust and have confidence, bestow on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. It's just reiterating what Jesus said in John 15, as he gave us commandment. So don't try to separate just because you'll see chapter 4 on the right. There's a different context than what the context is being laid in the First, in verse 22, 23, and 24, before we get to verse 1, 2, and 3 in chapter 4. And this is the co co commandment, that ye should leave on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. 
And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit. What Spirit? The Holy Spirit. Not an unclean spirit, the Holy Spirit, which he hath given us. Now, you might think there's a separate thought now being started than what just what we just read here in, the, in, the, in, these, in these verses, in verse 22, 23, and 24. No, it's a continuation. Chapter and verses were not in the Bible originally. That came later. These are letters that are being written to these places in Asia Minor for the most part. Beloved, believe it not every spirit. Verse 1. Beloved, pisteos again in the Greek, the second word there in the verse, pisteos. Beloved, trust or not have confidence on every spirit. We're not talking about some unspeed spirit here now. We're talking about whatever possesses a man, whether it's God's spirit through the Holy Spirit or whether it's anything else. Now, we've just been dealing with unclean spirit in this part of the uh, study in the last day series. I haven't even got to the other types of evil spirits. And I won't, not in this series. But beloved, not every spirit, we're not talking about some unseen spirit that you're going to have to try. We're going to talk about the people John's talking about who is possessed by these spirits. Beloved, trust or not have confidence in every spirit, but try the spirits where they are of God because many false prophets are gone out into the world. So what John's saying, beware. See what kind of spirit that prophet that preacher is possessed with. Now we want to be possessed with the Holy Spirit. That's a promise. That's the comforter that Jesus said would come. Well, what are I going to do to have it? Have trust and confidence in Jesus Christ did come. He was the only begotten Son of God. He fulfilled what was promised in the Old Testament. He died on that cross. He was tortured, he was beaten, he was bruised. He bled, he was speared. He died, but he rose again, just as Scripture prophesied. And there's a further promise, or there's more than that, but there's a further promise that most preachers dwell on. And they should. He's coming back again. But, but trust not in every spirit, but try the spirits where they are of God. Try. Just because someone says they're a prophet of God, just because someone says they're a preacher, just because someone says they're a pastor, just because someone says they're an evangelist, are you going to just take the word for it? Or are you going to try the spirits? How do you try the spirits? Through this. That's why you have to know it. That's why there's never an ending point of learning what God's Word has to say. Because we're, find, we're always, if you listen to the spiritual warfare series, we always find ourselves in a continuing spiritual warfare against an enemy that knows this through and through, better than any Christian that ever lived, including Paul. Not these demon spirits, but their commander, Satan. But I got news for Satan. He falls short next to Jesus Christ. He might think he's the hot shot, know it all, but next to Jesus Christ, he's nothing. He's nothing. So we have to try the spirits, and we're a lot more fortunate than those early New Testament Christians. All they had is a few letters to go by, and what they heard from the true apostles and prophets of their day. But believe. Trust, don't trust that. Don't have, just trust and have confidence in anyone. But believe not every spirit, but try the spirits where they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. In John's day, when this was written, if you know anything about church history, you'd be surprised how many false prophets. You'll see that when I get to the, uh, the Revelation letters in chapter 2 and 3. There were 
trying to introduce new doctrines into the church. And the type of new doctrines are not necessarily new. Okay, yeah, we confess that Jesus is the Son of God, but they were trying to slip in by the, in the back door some of the old doctrines that would worship idols and false gods. Amongst other things, they want to reintroduce back into the church, or not reintroduce, but reintroduce back into their lives which they practiced before. The Corinthian church was a champion at doing that. Smyrna and, and others, they were constantly being introduced with a new doctrine by some so-called prophet of God that would come by and say, well, this is what really Christ meant. We can do this, we can allow this. It's almost what we're experiencing today. There, there's many different ways to get to God or Jesus Christ. There's many different ways to get to heaven. There's many different ways to get on that line of eternity. Not all ways are bad or necessarily wrong because it's all good it all leads to a final destination if whatever that is molds you into the creature that whatever that is wants you to be and then label you a good person or whatever they want to label you label you on all they're doing is deceiving you just as they were trying to see these new testament christians as they would come by that's why john says test them try them to see the way of God. In our day, we can. Easier than they even could. But in our day, I guarantee you, we have a lot more false doctrines than they ever experienced. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confess it. What are they confessing? That Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit that confesses it, and every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ come in the flesh is not of God. Don't be uh, adding it to Scripture something that's not there. Jesus is telling those spirits, those demonic spirits, to keep their mouths shut. Because they already denied the truth once before. I believe, whether you believe it or not, it's really not important in the overall understanding of this, but I believe they even had an opportunity. Even though they were hybrids, if you want to call it that, they were given an opportunity. Noah preached long and hard. It didn't say in anywhere in any source, including the Bible, that he preached only to a certain few. He lived a long time building that boat. And he was a preacher of righteousness, according to Peter. Nobody wanted to hear the message. And only eight survived. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come is in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, or is the, of the Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. <clears throat> the one thing I do is I read a lot. Because I'm constantly trying to search out the facts. If I ever preach on demonology, the one thing you'll see over and over spirits. that possessed people, in this case, let's just stay with what, what John is dealing with, false prophets, don't confess 
They might confess that Jesus is the Son of God, but they don't confess that Jesus is the only way. They don't confess that Jesus said, I am the way, and there is no other way. It's usually Jesus and something else. And like I said already, the New Testament church, the early Christian history, I mean, the early church history we have on these people, they were constantly being introduced, and I'll get to that in Revelations 2 and 3, by so many other doctrines that would include Jesus Christ, but always something else also. See, hereby know you the Spirit of God, every spirit that confess it, that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Confessing the truth that Jesus Christ, it doesn't say any other, it doesn't add anything else to it, does it? It says Jesus Christ, Christ is the, in the flesh is, I mean, Jesus Christ is, is come in the flesh is of God. If Jesus Christ that came in the flesh is of God, then there is nothing else, is the point that's being made here. There is nothing else. That's why you tried the spirits, because if they could include something else, then guess what? It might sound Christian, but it really isn't Christian, if you want to label it that way. It isn't. It really is is a doctrine that's just based on Christ is it. There's nothing else. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. So that's even easier to find. If they come in with a false doctrine that just skips or just eliminates the point that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then that's even easier to distinguish. And he is the spirit of Antichrist. Ye are, ye are the God, ye are of God, little children, have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You hear that over and over again. Greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. And how are you going to overcome them? By knowing what the word, what the truth is. Not just because you hear somebody say something. Because you heard somebody say something and they base it upon the word of God. Without scripture picking. They are of the world. You are not of the world. But they are of the world. Therefore speak they of the world. And the world heareth them. It's always amazing. Yeah, Jesus Christ is, you know, this and that. But they always fall back in some worldly substitution that make you want to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Churches are guilty of that. They try to lure people in their doors by all their activities, all their functions, all the com camaraderie that people can have. And being a social creature, we, in some cases, in a lot of cases, seem to need that. So we're drawn to it. I mean, like attracts like. I mean, you're drawn to something that you have something in common with. And churches know that. And they know all the activities that they, that, that's on the outside. So what they did is bring those activities, Christianize them in their frame of reference, and put it in the church. So you don't have to go out there and buy a ticket at man's theater and watch a movie that, oh my God, you shouldn't be watching that unless you're in the church, watching on Friday night movie night or whatever the night is. You get it? You're not of this world. Because why we are of God, little children, have overcome them. We have overcome these false doctrines. These false prophets want to introduce Christ, but something else also. Don't fall for it. Stay connected with him. Stay trusting and having confidence, faithing in him. Pray that he gives you the insight through his word to see a false prophet who is staring right you in the face. They are of the world. You're not. 
They're of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And the spirit of error. Now, you might think just because someone says or confesses that Jesus Christ in the flesh is of God, someone possessed with the Spirit and not of the Holy Spirit is saying that is someone that you should listen to. You should follow, because obviously it says here in Scripture, hereby know ye the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Well, if he confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh of God, well, confessing, usually this word also has other attachments of agreement with something that is being declared. If you're confessing that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, then you have to confess everything that he came for. Not just this four or five words. Everything that he st stood for. Everything that he fulfilled. You're going to find someone. I have never found one that will confess in its totality that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God that actually will stick to that and teach you the truth of why he was the Son of God and everything that goes with it. They just might introduce themselves that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but then it's all the what-ifs and the buts and this and that. They get in the door with their trickery, but you can see shortly after that, wait a minute. You're confessing it, but your confession's based on a lie, not confessing it based on what Christ has done as the only begotten Son of God that was promised. There's a big difference, folks. There's a big difference. That's why my, probably my sermons are so long, because I just want to give you quick hitters, like scripture pickers, that try to make their point. I try to somehow present this where you can understand, in the most simplest way I can do it, that there's more to these verses than just reading through them and memorizing them. Confessing. In the Greek is confessing the truth. The whole truth. Confessing that Jesus Christ is coming to flesh is of God. Yes, he came to flesh is of God. Is of God. But what if you don't believe in it? What if you don't believe in everything else after that? Because that God requires too much giving up yourself to follow. We have a lot of that in today's world, where it's Christian after Christian confessing that they're disciples of Jesus Christ and they don't have a clue of what a disciple is. I mean, believe me, the Lima, the will of God. People are always asking for the will of God in their lives. And I've already preached the message. Maybe it's in the archives. The will of God. It starts with what Jesus presented. Denying yourself, taking up the cross, and following him. And following him means in his likeness. Not the likeness we want to create to produce a following that's convenient for us. No. It's not about our convenience. In his likeness. How many of you that say, I want the will of God in my life today, say, well, when you first said that, it starts with denying yourself. You usually want the will of God in your life to produce and to receive what you think is a benefit for you to make your following of Jesus Christ a little bit more convenient so you can rationalize in your mind somehow, your sick mind, that you are a believing, faithing Christian for Christ. without any of the 
sacrifice that goes with it at times. For God forbid if you feel any pain. God forbid you feel any pain. God forbid if it's going to cost you something. God forbid if you're going to have to read or sit or listen to the word of God. It might take away from your activities that you so seek and desire to have because you think it fills a void. Well, the only way that void's ever going to be filled is through Jesus Christ, my friend. Everything else is a fake facade. It's phony. It's temporary, maybe satisfying, but it's not long-lasting. Evil spirits, I mean, unclean spirits or evil spirits don't have a problem confessing even through an individual that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. If that's how they introduce you into their doctrines, their brand of religion. And of course, as I said, and every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come as the flesh is not of God. And that's exactly what Muhammad did. Exactly what Muhammad did. He was the false prophet of false prophets. He was the false prophet of false prophets. And you see unclean used. To move beyond this message now, I had something here I was going to read. Now I think I forgot it. I don't need it. You go to the Old Testament. It's just not a New Testament concept about unclean spirits. You see in Zechariah. I don't have enough time to do what I want to do tonight, but I'll start it. Zechariah ch chapter 12. This is worth going through these verses, even though I'm not going to really stop and teach these verses because this is so pertinent for the last day's teaching in this series that I want to do it injustice by teaching it here when, it not, when I'm not ready to do it yet in the sequence of teachings that need to be placed before this even happens. But I'm just going to read through it. Getting to Zechariah 13. Zechariah 12, verse 1. I'm going to get to an unclean spirit in a minute here, but let me just read these. Entertain me for a moment. The burden of the Lord, the burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord. I'm in Zechariah chapter 12 in the Old Testament, verse 1. Which stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundations of the earth, and formeth the spirit of man within him. I'm leaving that question now, and I want to get to where I want to go tonight. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling or a cup of poison in some translations, a cup of trembling unto all the people round about. Guess what? That's happening. That's happening. That's been happening since 1948. And the cup is trembling more and more to all these nations round about. When they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem, and in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All you have to do is read the news or listen to the news. Listen to me. Read what's available on, on this website in the Book of the Times to see for yourself that Jerusalem has become a burden stone for all people. We're even worried about if Israel will attack and destroy the nuclear sites in Iran. Because we know if that happens, it might unleash a nationwide or Middle East-wide war against Israel. And of course, all the Middle East wants to destroy Israel. All the Middle East wants is Jerusalem back. They claim it as their own. That's what Islam is. Once they go into a territory, even if they lose it, it's forever theirs in their mindset. 
And Jerusalem is that. As long as that Dome of the Rock is standing there on the mount, they're not going to be satisfied to the, the destroy Israel completely and recapture Jerusalem. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burden stone, stone for all people, all that burden themselves. With it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered or collected together against it. Now, don't think this is going to be all the people in this world. Got to keep it in context. How Zechariah said, definitely the nations around Jerusalem. In that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness, and I will open my eyes upon the house of Judah and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength in the Lord of hosts their God. In that day I will make the governors of Judah like a heart of fire among the wood and like a torch of fire in the sheaf. And they shall devour all the people round about on the right hand and on the left. And Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in Rome place, even in Jerusalem. The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first and the glory of house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at the day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God and the angel of the Lord before them. I'm skipping a lot. I'm just reading through these verses without teaching on them because I'm saving that for a later time. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all nations that come against Jerusalem. I got news for you. All the people against Israel and Jerusalem. Your destiny doesn't have much hope. Of course, I know you don't believe this because you don't believe the scriptures, but I do. And scriptures are being fulfilled. You live in so much darkness, you can't see the light. So you, you, you continue to be in denial that this is the truth. And whatever false religion or non-religion that you might practice eventually will leave you in a hopeless situation. The future for non-believers is not bright or the nations. And it shall come to pass in that day I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn. Speaking of Christ now, this hasn't happened yet, folks. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only Son, and, he sh and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness of his firstborn. In that day, there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem. Tell me when this has happened. In that day, shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem. As the mourning of Hadad Rimon in the valley of Megadon. In 2 Chronicles 35. You don't have to go there. Just write it down your notes. But if you want to go there, you can. Second kind of Chronicles 35. What does that mean, verse 11? They're going to mourn like the mourning that happened previously. You'll see, and I don't have time to go through it. I've preached in these chapters before. Second Chronicles 35, Josiah's death. We see a mourning take place. I'll just read, read 34 because well, I'll start with 33. And the archer shot at king, at king Josiah, and the king said to his servants, Have me away, for I am sore and wounded. Have, for I am sore and wounded. And Jeremiah lamented for Josiah. And all the singing men and the singing women spake of Josiah and their lamentations to this day. And made them an ordinance in Israel. And behold, behold, they are written in the Lamentations. You go back up to the verse 24, because I just read you 30, 
20, 25. When he died, his servants therefore took him uh, out of the chariot when he was dying and put him in the second chariot that he had when he was wounded. And they brought him to Jerusalem and he died there and he was buried in one of the sepulchers of his fathers. And all Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. And Jeremiah lamented. I don't have time to go to it tonight. But you can go to it. You've seen in Lamentations. And Jeremiah lamented for Josiah and all the singing men and the singing women spank of Josiah and their lamentations to this day and made them an ordinance in Israel. And behold, they are written in the Lamentations. That's what Zechariah is referring to. I'm trying to decide if I'm going to do something or not. Just be patient with me. I just probably don't have time, so I'm, going to, I'm just going to skip it. In that day shall there be a great morning in Jerusalem as the morning of Hadar Ramon in the valley of Megadon. So here you see them mourning. And it was such an event, a sadful experience, because they lost their king, Josiah, that even Jeremiah is lamenting over him and all the singing men and the singing women. Where, is, where you even have this event written in the Lamentations. So in that day, which still has yet not arrived, Israel and Jerusalem will finally recognize Christ for who he really was. Now there's some already there that do, but I'm talking about in the totality of the nation and of Jerusalem. They're going to say, oh my Lord, this is the one that we pierced. This is the one where well, they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one in bitterness for his firstborn. And all the land shall mourn every family apart. They are in such a mourning state, they don't even want to be around each other, not even their whole family members. Literally in the Hebrew, they're avoiding each other. They're so shameful that they didn't recognize Christ as their Savior, their first go, and his first coming. And it lists the family of Levi and so forth. And it gets to chapter 13, verse 1. And I'm running out of time, and I'm at the place I wanted to be tonight. In that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin. I just want to read you that to give you some insight what we still have yet to cover. We're a long way off from being anywhere near the conclusion of this series. We still have to cover a lot of these chapters in, in Zechariah and other minor and major prophets. And it shall come to pass in that day, said the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land. Well, I thought it already happened when Jerusalem went back. After all, you said they don't worship idols anymore. That's true. That's true. They're not falling for Asherah the way they did in the Old Testament. They're not following Baal and worshiping Baal. But what everyone seems to forget, especially people that preach in eschatology, that there's a certain amount of people, citizens of Israel, that do follow the practice of Islam. Still there today. There's Arab citizens, Israel, Arab, Arab Israeli citizens. You think everybody's a practicing Jew in Israel? You try to go as a practicing Jew to Iran. See how long you'll last. You try to go as a practicing Jew to Gaza or even Lebanon. See how long you last. You try to go now to Egypt and start establishing synagogues. See how long you last. But yet, in Israel, whom seem, everybody seems to be against, is allowing free practices of other religion besides the Jewish religion. 
Not that God is happy with that, by the way. He considers that idol worship still. Now, the Jews ain't doing it, but they're allowing it to be done. See, you might think, through your mindset, including in our own country, the freedom of worshiping anything you want is a cool thing. It might be to individuals that they get to practice whatever they want in this country. But when it's all said and done, no matter how cool you think you, your, your government is, or not your government, your, your establishment of government, in our case the Constitution is, it doesn't mean that God's pleased in it. I've preached on this before, and I've aggravated people on this before. Good, you need to be aggravated. You think God, the one that says, you shall have no other God before me, is pleased on any government establishment anywhere in this world that allows the worship and practice of following other gods besides him and him only? Think about it. If I had some of you confess, well, I'm kind of embarrassed I even brought it up now because you know what? It makes sense. You can't have your cake and eat it too. It's not country first, then God. And it shall come to pass in that day, said the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. Well, that's already happened. No, it has not. You don't believe me? Do your own research. I was going to bring it tonight, but I don't want to stop that long because I'm coming back to these chapters in the future. See how many practice of anything, including Islam, which is nothing more than an extension of the moon god religion, nothing more than idolatry, along with others that still is practiced in Israel besides what the Jews practice. This has not taken place first. I mean, yet. And it shall come to pass in that day, said the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. And I will cause the prophets, I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. Oh, we have an unclean spirit here now. Go to the board. I've got about five minutes to wrap this up. Tame is where Tuma. Tuma is the word here used for unclean in verse 13. I mean, verse 2, chapter 13. Tuma, unclean, filthy, un it's unclean food. Almost the same type of relationship as agatharthos. Actually, it's very close. The definitions, one's in Hebrew, one's in Greek, obviously. But Tuma, even though it means unclean, filthy, and unclean food, and so forth, came from the word Tame, which means to be unclean by idolatry. Idolatry. To be unclean by idolatry. So just not unclean, like you didn't take a shower that day, or filthy, or unclean food. Usually unclean food is basically food that was worshipped to idols and false whatever. <clears throat> or unclean food like... God said you should not eat this, that you'll see in the Mosaic Law. But it also has another definition. Just as this one, most scholarship ignores the connection with idol worship with Agathos, the same thing happens in the Hebrew. They don't want to acknowledge that Tuma came from Tame, which means to be unclean by adultery. So they should include it also, whatever else is unclean, it refers to then unclean because of something else. Now here we have it's quite obvious what scriptures go back to me now, come back to me now. What scripture is refer, referring to what is unclean. Verse 2, and it should come to pass in that day, said the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. Why they shall be no more remembered? Because you won't have an unclean spirit that's possessed these prophets including Muhammad, the, prophet, the false prophet of false prophets, and the unclean spirit to pass out of the lands. And it goes on to read. See the connection there? And it goes on to read, And it shall come to pass that when any shall yet prophesy, 
Then his father and his mother that began him shall say unto him, Thou shalt not live, for thou speakest lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and his mother that began him shall thrust him through when he prophesied. prophesied. <coughs> it's not going to be liked. Once they realize whom they have pierced. So this raised the question, are they going to recognize whom they have pierced before his second coming? Or this happens after his coming? Or this happens when the remnant that will be raptured out before the final events take place? So I just gave you three possibilities. Before, rapture time, or after rapture time? You want to know the answer, you need to keep on listening. Not tonight. <clears throat> and it shall come to pass in that day, verse 4, the prophet shall be ashamed every one of his vision when he had pro when, when he hath prophesied, neither shall they wear a rough garment to deceive, or a garment that people that would usually is a garment of hair, but it could be a garment of lies, it could be a garment of anything. But he shall say, I am no prophet, I am a husband, for man thought, taught me to keep cattle from my youth. Of course, they're going to deny that they're a prophet at that point because they know the people saying, uh-uh, been deceived long enough. Idols out of our land. Sorry, the Jews have not got there yet. And one shall say unto him, what are these wounds in thy hands? Then he shall answer, those which, which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Now, how many times you heard this? Related to Jesus Christ. I'm sorry because you have wounds in your hand. They don't even know how to read the Hebrew correctly. That preached that. See how scripture is taken out of context or scripture because they read it in the King James or any other translation and they think, whoa, that must be Jesus Christ. No, we're referring to the false prophets still here. Literally, it should, it should read or it means in the Hebrew a type of wound that you would receive whether on the chest or the back. Whether on the chest or the back. In other words, if you were found to be a false prophet, you're going to get a beating. A beating! Israel have no more at some point where they're going to deny the Son of, the Son of God, the only begotten Son of Jesus Christ. And they will not tolerate, tolerate no one, no one, to preach it any differently. Now, I know you probably haven't heard that. Or if you have, it's been taught a little bit differently. Well, you'll hear from me. I've studied these scriptures for years. There's a time coming when Israel finally will recognize who the only begotten Son of God is. And when that happens, yes, there'll be a morning. And yes, finally, this prophecy, and I will cut the names of the idols out of the land, and that should be no more remembered, because that and the prophets that preach the false doctrines will finally will be eliminated. And if you're caught doing it, you're going to be chased out of town. You're going to be beaten. Now, when does this happen? Like I said, there's three possibilities. Now, <clears throat> I want to cover one other word that you'll see in Scripture. I don't have time to go through all of it tonight. And I don't know if I'm going to spend the time because I want to move on to Muhammad. I'll probably come back to it. Nadad. That's another word you'll see for unclean or impurity. You, you see it with menstruous situations. But you see it quite often impure because of idolatry. Because of idolatry. You go to Second Chronicles, since we're in, let's just stay in Second Chronicles. I can go to different places, but let's just go to Second Chronicles. Because I'm running out of time, and that's the closest chapter to where I'm at right now. Second Chronicles, chapter 29. Where should I begin? I'll just go with verse 16. The priest went into the inner part of the house of the Lord. This is when Hezekiah commands temple reforms in his first year. And the priest went to the house, inner parts of the house of the Lord to cleanse it. To cleanse it. Why? Because Israel allowed, once again, and there are many times where they would repent and 
follow God, and then after a certain amount of years go by, they would forget, and they would go right back into following and worshiping and practicing all these other idol, uh, religions, false religions, and bowing down to false idols, including polluting the temple area. And in verse 16 it says, And the priests went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it, and brought out all the uncleanliness that they found in the temple of the Lord into the court of the house of the Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. You'll see in the previous verse, they sanctify themselves first, came according to the commandments of the king by the words of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. To cleanse the house of the Lord. And the priests went to the inner parts of the house of the Lord to cleanse it and brought out all the uncleanness. Cleanliness. Circle that word. Guess what word that is? Guess what word that is? Where's my mom? There it is. Remember in Zechariah chapter 13, we talked about Tamiah, which came from Tamiah, I mean, uh, Tamay, Tamiah from Tamay, to be unclean by adultery, unclean whatever the uncleanliness was for or caused by. Here we have in 2 Chronicles 29 also referring to a certain type of uncleanliness. What kind of uncleanliness? Here in Hezekiah, false items of false worshiping and idols, and idols. Here we have in Zechariah 13, that says, We'll call off the names of the idols out of the land, and no more shall be remembered. Idolatry, idolatry, both places will be Hezekiah eliminated in his reign, the time's coming where the Jews will finally realize who they pierced. They will mourn. They will repent. They will cast out all the names of the idols and they will remember them no more. And they will not tolerate, tolerate anyone, in my opinion, that will deny the only begotten Son of God and preach something that's different than the gospel. Than the gospel. I don't have time to go to the die. But it's the same word you'll see used in Scripture also that points to areas where you find idolatry being dealt with because it was unpure, it was unclean. Now come back to me. A little frustrated because I can't get to that, but I think you get the picture. No matter if you go Old Testament or New Testament, Old Testament or New Testament, you find how God frowns upon anything that deals with idolatry. Period. And it could mean anything, just not Islam, by the way. As I said in the beginning of this teaching, it could be yourself. It could be fame. It could be power. It could be your ego. It could be money. It could be anything that puts itself in a place where God should be, where Jesus Christ should be. It doesn't matter. Now, Muhammad would be possessed by an unclean spirit. In unclean spirits, it's just not, go back to the board, talking about food that's unclean, something that's foul, somebody doesn't take a bath, or any of those things. When God deals with an unclean spirit, he's talking about someone that rebelled, that lived, in this case, demons, that was the cause of the destruction before Noah's flood that does now still exist in Christ's day and even today in a demonic, demonic form controlled by powerful fallen angels with Satan as their leader. They're doing his bidding for him. It's used. Unfortunately, I can't even tell you how much of scholarship has ignored this definition. That's why they can't see things clearly. 
they chose to ignore it because to get into these unseen spirits, the unseen evil spirits, the unseen of anything, including, you'll be surprised how much of Christianity doesn't even believe a devil exists. So instead of dealing with it and try to explain it through using scripture and define it properly, they ignore it. They eliminate it. I'm trying to bring the connection back with idol worship. And like I said, idol can mean anything. I'm just using this particular part of the series to show you how Muhammad became under the influence and controlled by demons and not just any demon, an unclean spirit type demon that takes, cries, tears, foameth, and bruising, and throws down. And we'll see all those characteristics in Muhammad's life experienced by him. And it's not because he was mentally disturbed or he had a psychological disorder. It's because he became possessed. He became possessed. Now... We're going to look at the data that comes from the earliest biographical works once again. But now we're going to come from this mind frame to see how Muhammad, just as the boy in Luke 9 and other places that became possessed with unclean spirits, found himself experiencing the same exact things as he was becoming demonically controlled. Now, <clears throat> if you want me to continue this, and I'm going to do it anyway, but if you're interested, I want to hear from you. Now, I said a mouthful tonight. I went in almost an hour and a half of teaching. You can at least go another 12 minutes and let me know if you're at least starting to understand what I'm trying to lay down here. Both Old or New Testament, unclean is unclean, and it's usually closely related to any type of idolatry worship in all its definition of it. In not just the moon god, but in Muhammad's case, we'll see how that becomes the extension of the moon god worship, which is a continuation, but now called the eighth beast in our day. I know I read a lot of stuff in Zechariah that probably frustrated you because you want me to stop and just deal with it then. I just wanted to read what led up to it to show you how the unclean spirit, even in Zechariah, as he was preaching it, will be exercised from that land where false prophets won't have their influence anymore, including what's there now in Israel, and there's plenty. John dealt with it in his day. Yeah, they could believe that Jesus Christ, or confess it, but that's not good enough. Confessing in, in, in the Greek, especially how it's used, goes beyond just saying the words is actually confessing that you believe all what Jesus Christ was all about. Not just saying the four or five words. Those four or five words came with an impact meaning of, oh, I believe everything about Jesus Christ. In our day, what we have here in the Word of God concerning Him. Now, if you got it, I want to hear from you. Play this song.